guys, welcome back. It is your favorite Gimp of the Limp, and I'm here with a special treat for you all. I have Black Horse, a grand tactical game by Arrigo Villacona. Hope I'm saying that one right. And this is by Tiny Battle Publishing. This, like so many other games, is a Cold War gone hot. It is set in the summer of 1989, and the Soviets have decided that they are crossing the border, they're launching their attack, and they are jumping into it. So your options are either to play as the Soviets, where you're going to try to push through, take the objectives, and uh, further on into Europe, or as the Americans, where you're trying to hold them back while you build up your reinforcements and forces in the area. So this first uh, video I'm going to do is just a review, quick review, not uh, not anything overly in depth. And then I'm going to follow it on with a few videos where I'm playing the game so you guys can actually uh, see it in action because you really do need to see this one in action uh, to grasp the, the depth of it because there is something that does set this one apart and make it special compared to so many other games because there are plenty of games that are set in that Cold War gone hot era. So it's nice to see a little something different being tried. To start our review, we're gonna go over the components, then we'll get into the gameplay and how it actually works. So components are actually rather light. This is a, a cheaper game uh, than you're gonna find. Uh, usually most war games you're looking at about hundred bucks, if not more, you can tell from the box. This one's rather small, so all you're going to have is a few smaller counter sheets, one paper map, which is single-sided, so this is it when it comes to the map. You're going to have a couple of these command player aids, obviously the rule book, and then a couple of player aids that have the actual uh, stuff, command, uh, combat results table, and modifiers, and train effects chart, and like all that on it. Uh, but that's it right? It is not a heavy game by any means. It's actually a rather light box. When it comes to the components themselves, it's about mid-grade. Nothing's bad overall. There is one part that is a little bit of a, a sticking point, uh, but it's definitely serviceable for what you're paying. You're paying about 50 bucks depending, uh, plus taxes and shipping. So that's going to affect just depending on where you live. But the game, like I said, it's not overly expensive, but you're kind of getting what you're paying for. The paper map is very thin. So if you're not filming, put in under some plexiglass or something like that to uh, protect the map because this is one of those that you could tear easily uh, depending if you're not careful with it and you want to try to prevent creases because this one can crease easily and then you'll start getting that little white fold mark to it so just be careful with it. The rest of the stuff, the, the player aids, they're perfectly fine, they're card stock, rule book, perfectly fine, no problem. The only other issue when it comes to the components is the counters and if you'll notice on these I'll try to zoom in a little bit so you guys can see I had actually gone and clipped all of these counters every one of them and I don't usually do that anymore because most war games are shipped pre-rounded so you don't have to worry about it as much when it's a cheaper game, though, they have to save cost on production, which means it's not going to be pre-rounded counters. They cost more. I understand that, and I'm fine with regular just die-cut punched counters, usually with the exception that these die-cut ones did not cut well. I can't say for a fact whether or not it's just my copy alone, but there are three counter sheets that come with this game, and out of all the counter sheets, I had issues with every single one. So that makes me lean towards it being a manufacturer issue versus just a one-off since I had the problem with all the counter sheets. And that problem was that the counters were tearing as I was punching them out. Usually on the die cuts, you can pop them out fairly easily and then just snap, crackle, pop you're good. You might have a little fraying on the edges, but nothing bad. And usually you don't have to worry about clipping if you don't want to. These were bad enough that I actually took the time to set down the counter sheet and get an X-Acto blade and go through slicing each one of them before I punch them out. 
And I hate to say it, but that's a must do, not a may do before you punch these counters, because otherwise you might actually tear the, the counter back completely off. Right. I had a couple where it was close that uh, I was going to just flat out row in a counter. And I hate to say that because I, I really do like the game. The game's going to get a positive review. I like what they've got going on here. But uh, the counters just bring it down. You're going to have to put in that effort trimming the counters and then clipping them afterwards because the edges are going to be just severely frayed if you don't uh, clip them. I can say the juice is worth the squeeze, though. You're going to have to put in some effort. It's not a huge amount of counters. What is it? A couple hundred, maybe, uh, counters total at max. So it, it's not a huge amount to, to take care of. It's just a bit of a you know, irritation uh, that you can't just punch them and start getting everything ready. You're going to have to take a little bit of time trimming everything before you can actually get into the game. So when it comes to the game itself, there are four scenarios that you can play that are listed down into the rule book. First one's more of an introductory scenario, and then two and three are bite-sized pieces of the grand campaign. And then the grand campaign is the one that has everything. I think it's a four-day, yep, yeah, four-day campaign over the assault of the, the Soviet forces. So you can play it from the start, right? When they first start pushing in from uh, Eastern Germany all the way through their initial assaults. It's up to you on how much you want to uh, play. I am going to be setting up for my playthrough the second scenario, which is the, the beginning of it. The third scenario has got it to where you're kind of in the middle of it. And like I said, the fourth one is the whole thing. Obviously, from looking at it, you can tell that this game is a hex encounter style war game and it operates a little bit on an I go you go type system uh, but really this is what is setting the game apart as its order system I'm not going to get in depth on to the rest of it if you've played a hex encounter war game if you're watching this channel you've played one before you understand the basic premises of the the move the fire the shoot the fire missiles all that stuff right modifiers all good gummies this right here there's two of these one for each faction this is what sets this game apart and it's the way that orders are carried out because in so many other war games you're going to have that you'll move a unit it's marked as done the hill move a unit it's marked as done and then you do that until you've done all your units and then eh, you clean up phase and then you go again and repeat right here it doesn't work that way. This reminds me a little bit of the blind sword system that we saw in uh, a Fearful Sacrifice. Damn, it took me a second to uh, remember that one. In the fact that the, the command system was what really set that game apart. Now, of course, that game is phenomenal, but the way that the orders were carried out was what really just mm, took it to that next level. That's what you're getting here. It's not a, a, a definite, right? There's that possibility that you can push just that little bit farther, but there's a risk involved with that. And that's something that I like. You can have this battle plan laid out and you think you've got everything set up and then some random factor pops in and then all of a sudden your formation is, is finished for the turn and you had big plans for that formation. Or vice versa, maybe they just keep pushing and you get lucky on some dice rolls and you get to just squeeze through that last attack that really makes the difference. You have the ability to have that happen. So how this is going to work is with each formation of units, right? You're going to have a, a group, a battalion or a, a Soviet regiment. And that's actually something else that I like about this game is that it takes note of the fact that the U.S. forces are more on small unit leadership, whereas the Soviet forces have uh, bigger, just raw, just, ah, huge swaths of units. So they don't get down into the, the smaller nitty gritty like the Americans do. Right. You can tell looking at the American board, it has many more boxes for its formations whereas the Soviets only have a few. So when the Soviets activate, they're going to be activating more units at once, but they don't have the ability to be as, as surgical, as precise as the American forces do. 
you're going to have a formation. So like, for example, the American formation that I have set up here was the 11th uh, ACR, and they have uh, some uh, infantry that have been attached to them as well. But for our purposes, we have the 11th ACR right here, okay? All right, I went ahead and moved it. Since I'm talking about the 11th ACR, I might as well go ahead and have the, the sheet here on the center of the map so you guys can see what I'm talking about. Let's say we wanna activate this formation. Well, there's going to be a command counter here on the side that is keeping track of, of how stressed that, that formation is becoming, right? So they'll start in green and green on our snafu table shows us the very little chance of anything bad happening to them. For the most part, it's all no effect, so you can activate them without any worry. But as they get more engaged, so if they start attacking enemy units, they're going to become lightly engaged. And then if the enemy units start fighting, uh, firing at their units, then they're going to be, uh, become heavily engaged. And that's going to increase the modifiers on this little snafu table. And as they issue orders, you're going to tick them down, right? So we issue a move order and then we do this and then we do this. And each time it's going to move us one or two boxes down this track. And you see it goes from green to yellow to orange to red. And that's going to move us along here. And that's where I was talking about it, that it's not a traditional I go, you go system in that you'll move these units and they're done for the turn. And then you'll fire them next turn and they're done for the turn. It's not like that. You can move them and then the Soviets are going to go. And then maybe you want to fire with them and then the Soviets will go. And then you do something else over here, Soviets will go, then you can come back to, you can keep activating units more than once, but each time you do, they're going to keep getting stressed, 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 and that's gonna keep adding up. And each time you're going to roll a D10 and compare it to this table. And as you can see, when you start off, very little chance of anything bad happening. But as you tick up, that stress level goes up, there's a bigger and bigger chance that your units are going to start getting disrupted. They're start going to be uh, low on ammo. They could be listed down as just finished, which means that uh, they're done for the turn. You can't do anything else uh, with them. There's even chances of the HQ being struck or, or uh, counter battery or artillery. Lots of different things can happen as you're moving your unit, as the command counter here, the formation is moving up in stress. And that's that part I was talking about earlier, where you have the ability to just keep pushing that little bit farther. So I'll see if I can find a, an image for our counter, but I'll hold it up here just in case I can't find one. Its command value is an eight, right? That's, that's actually rather good. What that means is that it, during the recovery phase, gets to tick down eight on this uh, set of boxes here. So eight stress, eight whatever, comes down and it has the ability to tick those all up on the next turn. That's great, but you can go past that. You can go past what it is. You can play safe, right? And not go higher than what the formation is. That way you're guaranteed to be back down in green on the next turn. But if you want, if it gets dire, you can push it all the way up here into the red if you want to. But like I was saying, that's when the chances of bad things happening to your units start increasing even more and more and more up to even in the superior HQ. So the HQ above this formation gets listed down as finished. So you're going to have that for every formation that activates for the Soviets, for the American forces. Whenever they activate, you will, the 11th ACR activates here. All these units get to do whatever they're going to do. But it's not just the, the moving and the shooting and the assaulting with the units that are here on the board. You also have assets that you can use as well. Things like helos. Uh, Offboard artillery or even stinger missiles. God, I love that thing. There's stinger missiles in this thing is freaking beautiful. So you have uh, things that are attached, right? The, the little artillery blast that you get to call in, and that's abstracted to an extent. So you're not going to have uh, 
artillery assets on the board for the most part. There are some exceptions when it comes to the Soviet units that they will have some artillery units on the board. For the most part, though, they're going to be kept track of over here. But they do have the ability to have, like I said, counter battery fire. So even the units that are here can be attacked. But you can call in your helos. They can be put on the board within command radius and all the other good stuff and do their attacks, but the enemy might have some AA fire that they can launch back. Like I said, you have Stinger missiles that you can use if they start calling in their helos against you. So it isn't just the, the simple, hey, I'm going to fire these machine guns and you're going to fire your tank and I'm going to move these guys. No, there's a lot of back and forth and there is the ability for things like reaction fire. So you do have the ability to do, you know, your your op fire, depending on what uh, stuff the opponent's doing. And it's not just uh, movement. Uh, fire attacks or assault can trigger a op fire uh, opportunity fire as well. So in essence, you're never really going to know exactly how long a turn is going to be because that's going to come down to both players. This is similar to World at War 85 in that the turn will continue until both players pass or both players have to pass if all of their uh, formations are you know, finished by the, the snafu table and they don't have a choice. But regardless, when both players pass, that's when the turn is going to end. So you don't have that definite all units are activated, turns over, you know, know when the end's coming. There's that chance that uh, a unit may get to activate, may not get to activate, that uh, really brings that game to the next level. One of the things that I loved the most about World of War 85 was that uncertainty in the way that the formation cards worked. These Command tokens here and the HQs that represent them on the board bring that same feeling into this game. Now, the difference is here, though, is the, the choice is completely to the player. So it's not random on what units are going to be activated. You get to pick exactly what formation you want to activate. Your opponent gets to pick exactly what formation they want to activate. So it's not like a random chip pull or card draw or anything like that. You do have that choice. You can keep picking the same unit over and over and over and over if you want to. But like I said, that's going to tick up their stress a lot quicker, especially if they're heavily engaged, because if they're heavily engaged, they're not going up one on the track. They're going up two on the track every time you issue an order to them. And that will add up quickly. Also, when it comes to the formations and how they activate, there is a, uh, a little bit of give and take, a uh, maneuver type warfare going on in that, especially with your HQ counters, they're going to represent what formation your unit or what uh, type of mode your formations are in, whether they're deployed, which means they're they're set, they're they're in their fighting holes, they're ready to go, they're ready to get stuck in, hooking and jabbing, or if they're in tactical mode, which you're going to flip over your HQ counter, and your HQ counter will go from a tent to a armored vehicle to signify the fact that now they're they're set to be more mobile, now they're ready to move, or if they're not uh, in tactical or deployed mode. They will be in march mode. And march mode means that they're getting the bonuses from the roads on the table. And that is something that is different. Usually in a war game like this, moving along a road, you're just flat out going to get that move, uh, man, ah, movement bonus. You're not going to get that here. You have to be in march. You have to deliberately have your units set to be moving along the road to get those extra movement points when it comes to uh, following these roads. If you're in uh, deployed, deployed doesn't matter, you can barely move in deployed, but if you're in tactical, you don't get those extra points. You just move along as normal. So you're going to have to keep that in mind as well because as your formations flip back and forth, right? So they're in deployed or they're in a tactical formation, that's going to affect their command range. And you want to keep your units within their command range. Command range can be as low as one, depending on the HQ that's controlling them, all the way up to 12 hexes away. If it's like a superior HQ that's going to be having a, a larger influence across the battlefield. 
So that's really what takes this game to the next level is the way that the the formations activate and the way you're keeping control of this and the snafus table, uh, its effect on the gameplay. That's really what is going to influence your decision on whether or not you want to get in this game. And honestly, I love it. There's so many cool little things that get added into it. Like I said, the artillery, the offboard helos, stinger missiles, uh, there's uh, special munitions that you can use with your artillery. The Americans have access to this thing. Uh, what is it called? Fasm, I think. Fasm. Uh, basically, it's an artillery shell they launch in, and it drops these little uh, armor-piercing mines around to attack armored vehicles so you can deny a hex to the Soviet units as they're moving through. Uh, basically, it tears up the road and fills it full of mines, so if they drive that way, they'll get blown up or they'll get attacked. Uh, the Soviets have access to chemical weapons uh, that they get to use, and of course, their own helos and artillery as well. Truth be told, I am uh, pleasantly surprised with the the depth of the gameplay that comes in this box, because I was expecting something more beer and pretzels like, uh, not easy per se, but something, you know, just basic and play in the evening. I want that NATO feel without uh, bringing out NATO. But no, there's actually a whole lot going on here. There's a, a much deeper level of gameplay than I was expecting. Uh, add to that uh, the solitaire playability, right? The orders, the way that they work, I think works well for solitaire play. If there was a random aspect to it, I think it would take it to a, a better level. Uh, think again, I'm going to reference World War 85 again. And that one, you, there was the car draw mechanic for the four missions that activated. And something like that is a lot more conducive to solitary play than having to make all the choices. So you don't have that going for you here. But the snafu table, right? making it to where you don't know if a order is always going to work, if something bad might happen, if a unit might just be ordered as finished and you don't get to complete something. Uh, that will add enough randomness that I think uh, you'll be perfectly fine solitarying this. There is no hitting information. There's nothing like that. So no iffy units anywhere. You know where everything is. So it's going to work fine for solitaire play. It's not as good as some others, but uh, if you're like me, that's not going to bother you. You'll still have fun with it. Ultimately, though, I got to say Black Horse is definitely a recommend from me. I There's the, the few snafus, right? The, the counters aren't great. There are some errata, so I would be expecting a second edition uh, coming before too long. For example, here, the Woods. The AP modifier is marked down as 12. That's actually supposed to be negative two. You can tell that's a mistype. It's not a huge deal, but it's a little niggle when it comes to the game. Uh, for what you're paying and the amount of gameplay that you get in the box, definitely recommend. If you want to wait to see if they do a second edition or an updated kit, before you get into the game, uh, it's not gonna hurt you. But if you're looking for a, uh, you know, Cold War Gone Hot game that has a more innovative system to it than just a simple I go, you go uh, game. This one definitely covers that. It's easy to get to the table. It's not counter heavy. There are a fair amount of Soviet units, but it's not anywhere near like you're going to be bogged down. There's not thousands and thousands of counters. Uh, it's very easy to keep track of. One relatively small map that you have to worry about. So this is something that you could break out in an evening, get done, no problem, uh, versus something like World of War 85 or, or NATO or uh, Third World War, uh, games of that nature that it's going to take a little while to get it out, get it set up. Da -da. This, you can do it all in the evening, finish a game, and then pack it away and be done. But anyway, that's going to be it for me on this review. You guys stay tuned. If you want to see some of the gameplay, I'm going to play through a portion of the second scenario where the Soviet units are pushing through across this border from eastern Germany and a 
portion, not a huge amount, a small, relatively small amount of American units versus the huge mass of Soviet units are trying to hold them back while they're waiting for reinforcements to come in. So if you guys want to see that gameplay, stay tuned. I will have it up as soon as I can. All right. Y'all take care. I'll catch you in the next one.